before you know anything about the geometric, even though we talked about it yesterday, um, the, what the actual formula is, finding the first six terms. If you know the first term is six, the second term, you just take that six and multiply it by the common ratio. So six times a third is six thirds, and six thirds is two. Take two and multiply it by a third. Two times a third is two thirds. Take two thirds and multiply it by a third. Two thirds times one third is two ninths. Two ninths times one third is two twenty sevenths. And two twenty sevenths times one third is two over eighty one. Gotcha. Um, find the eighth term of the geometric sequence whose first term is negative four and whose common ratio is negative two. So we could go through this entire thing again and, you know, count our way up to the eighth term, but that would just take too long. So essentially to get from your, let's say, let's look for the, this pattern here. To get from our first term to our sixth term, how many times did we multiply by the common ratio? Once, twice three times, four times, five times, right? Whatever that difference is, sixth term to the first term. So we multiplied by that R value five times. So for this one, if our first term is negative four and we're looking for our eighth term, to get it, we're gonna start with negative four and we're gonna multiply by our common ratio of negative two, how many times? To get from the first to the eighth. Seven times. And then, oh boy, negative two to the seventh power. Is that a negative number or a positive number, first of all? Negative. Okay, I gotta use my fingers. Two times two is four, times two is eight, 16, 32, 64, 128. And then we're just doing 128 times four, which you could really just multiply that by two, two more times. So 256 and then 612, 256, 512. Yes, if you need to do that out, you can. And there you go. So logically it makes sense but we do have a formula if you just choose to kind of memorize that and, and run with it. it. The formula shows exactly what we just <clears throat> uh, figured out. You start with your first term and you multiply by your common ratio. As long as you're starting with the first term, n minus one times. So this one was six minus one times, we did it five. This one was eight minus one times, we raised it to the seventh. Good? It does get tricky if you don't know the first term. So let's see if I'm going to have one on here like this. I should, I, I want to do one for you. What if I tell you that the seventh term is 12 and the common ratio is, I don't know. I'm going to give you one where you need a calculator. The common ratio is uh, three halves. And then I ask you, what's the 20th term? This formula, and I'm giving you this one because this is the one that the regents gave, and it's like the, the main one, but it banks on the fact that you know your first term, right? We don't really know our first term here. So could you go backwards and find your first term? You could do that. Or, I actually told all of my Algebra 2 kids, this formula can be used from any term. It shouldn't, I, I don't like that they limit it to the first term. Why not just make it any k term as your starting term, and then you'll multiply by the common ratio, not n minus one times, but n minus k times. So why limit the a sub one to the first term? And that one there for the first term is the same reason we have the one up there. 
because what we really want to realize is that we're starting with 12 in this case. We're starting with the seventh term of 12, and we're multiplying by 3 halves. How many times to get to the 20th term? 13 times, right? You'll, the first time will get you to 8, then a 9, then a 10, then to 11. You can kind of count it out on a smaller example to make sure that the difference is really what happens there. But it is. Like, if you wanted to get to the 8th term, you would multiply by your common ratio just one time. And that's the difference between the 7th term and the 8th term is one term in between. You know, one term differs them. So, if this were the case, a sub 20 would be your starting number of 12, and you'd multiply by your 3 halves... 13 times, which really comes from 20 minus the seventh term that we started on. Does that make sense? And then I gave you that. That's going to be a calculator question. Um, but the a sub 1 really limits you. And so I'm not sure how Mrs. Zig I did it, but a lot of times teachers will, if you do get this kind of information, they'll make you use the formula once to get the first term back. And then once you have the first term, then they'll let you use the formula again in the other direction. And this way, it just allows you to do it all in one shot. Because there really should be no reason this only limits you to the first term. So that's my side note. Okay. Um, this gives you a, a sequence and wants you to write your own general term formula. So you want to look at the pattern if you're identifying as um, arithmetic or geometric and realize it's a very easy times 2 times 2 times 2. So the common ratio is 2. Your first term is 3. So an, an equation for a general nth term, a sub n equals your first term of 3 times your common ratio of 2 to the n minus 1 power. So because we have the first term here, you might as well use it in the first term case. And we definitely don't multiply those and make it 6, correct? because multiplication would never come before exponents in PEMDAS. So there's a general equation. And now we like general equations as opposed to recursive because we can jump right to the 20th term. So a sub 20 equals 3 times 2 to the 19th power, 20 minus 1. And then I would say calculator for that. Might be humongous. 3 times 2 to the 19th power. Well, it's not terrible. 1572864. 1,572,864. Wonderful. Just to review quickly, even though this is not asking for it, if it was a recursive request, remember that recursive formulas have to be given in two parts. The first part is saying giving a term. And if you have the option of giving the first term, get it. The first term is three. And any nth term is achieved by taking the previous term, a sub n minus 1, and doing what to it? What are we doing to the previous term on each of these subsequent terms? Multiplying by 2. So you just put a times 2 out in front. 2 times the previous term. But finding the 20th term with that recursive formula would be a challenge. Okie doke. But just to keep in mind, explicit versus recursive still. Okay. Now, the series formula, I think there's, I think the depth of understanding where this came from is a little out of our reach. It, it's not as easy to explain or to wrap your head around as the, you know, the sequence formulas are or the arithmetic series one is. So the geometric se series one, I'm just going to say memorize it. But the main thing, first of all, is to know that you're using this if you get some indication that you're adding all the terms together, whether in, it's through a word problem that they kind of hint at you'd be adding them all together. Was this our nursing home talk yesterday, this class? So what comes up on my phone last night, but a, an article from the Buffalo News about long-term nursing home care 
in New York or in New York in general, city by city. Buffalo's was like one twenty a year. We said eighty, didn't we? Weren't we like hovering around? I googled like national. It was eighty thousand a year, one hundred and twenty thousand a year. Just letting you know. Worth worth the college. Anyway, carrying on. It was just so funny. I'm like, why is this coming on my phone right now? It was very weird. It just came out in the Buffalo News yesterday. All right. So find the sum of the first 18 terms. So you're looking for your series total through 18 terms. A sub 1 is 2. 1 minus, what is our common ratio name? Negative 4. Now, that negative 4 should be in parentheses because it has an exponent attached to it. So I'm not going to change, and this is what I always can remember as being a common mistake. 1 minus negative 4, as we see it right now, is not going to be 1 plus 4 because it's 1 minus negative 4 being raised to the nth power, which in this case is 18. So your exponent would come first. Your negative 4 to the 18th power would come first. And that's going to be a positive number. So it'll be 1 minus that positive number. All over 1 minus r, which is 1 minus negative 4. This one, on the other hand, can be changed to 1 plus 4 and should be changed to 1 plus 4. Do we follow? Not this one because it has an exponent. At the end of the day, this is going to be, and sometimes if, it's, if I don't put it on a calculator section, uh, and if it's a, like a multiple choice, you would have to know why this one is the same as that. Because your, your multiple choice answer would probably say this one. And guess what? They would probably also have this incorrect one as an option. So you need to make sure you understand why 1 minus a negative 4 to the 18th power turns to this and not this. So my explanation would be because if you were doing order of operations, you would do that first. And negative 4 to the 18th power is the same as the positive 4 to the 18th power. And so, therefore, that negative is pretty negligible, so they just kind of lose it and just treat it as a 4 to the 18th power. Whereas the people who see the double negative and think it turns into a positive and aren't considering order of operations are going to pick that one. Okay? And if it's on the calculator section, we would just plug this in. Two parentheses, 1 minus 4 to the 18th power. Oh boy. And then divide it by 5. I got this. Are we all familiar with that notation? With the E. Scientific notation, right? So I'm just going to move my decimal place 10 units to the right. So negative 2.748779073. Well, it was there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and I don't see any other numbers, so I'm just going to fill with zeros. So that's probably slightly rounded. Okie doke. Okay. So similar to yesterday on this next one with summation notation. By hand, you'd plug in 1, you'd plug in 2, you'd plug in 3, you'd plug in 4, you'd plug in all the way up to 10, you'd add them all together. Too long. On a calculator, you guys would just type in the summation notation. You don't have one, right? So when you get to a summation notation problem, if it is a manageable amount of plugins, like if it's starting with an I of 1 up to an I of 4, that's fine. You can do that the, the traditional way. Going to 10 is too much, there's probably a pattern that you can pick up on. So my recommendation for you is plug in just the first couple of numbers. So if I plug in a one, I'm gonna get six times two to the first, which is 12. 
If I plug in a 2, I'm going to get 6 times 2 squared, which is 6 times 4, which is 24. And if I plug in a 3, I'm going to get a 6 times 2 to the 3rd, which is a 6 times an 8, which is a 48. And once you do the first at least 3, you should notice, is this an arithmetic pattern or is this a geometric pattern? Is there a common difference or a common ratio? Am I adding the same thing or am I multiplying by the same thing? Excuse me. Multiplying. So it's a geometric with a common ratio of 2, because we're times 2 times 2 times 2. And once you know that it's geometric and you're adding them all together, use your geometric series formula. So S sub, what's our n value? 10 terms, right? If you plug in 1 through 10, you're plugging in 10 terms. Equals A sub 1, I'm just pulling from my formula above. A sub 1, we already knew it was 12. 1 minus your 2 to the 10th power over 1 minus your r of 2. This one always fascinates me because unlike the uh, arithmetic one where you need the last term, you don't really ever need the last term for this one, which we'd have to kind of do a proof and wrap our head around why that, proof, why that formula is the way it is, but you don't need it. Um, and then this would just be calculator work. So 12 times 1 minus 2 to the 10 is negative 12, 276 over negative 1, which gives us 12, 276. Good? And last one, like a real serious thing you might have to consider someday if you're worried about your bottom line finance what? What'd you say? Good, don't. Are your bottles going to make their way to my recycling bin or are you going to refill those? I'm greedy for your nickels. <laughs> All right, Company A offers 30000 the first year with 6% raises for the first five years. Company B offers $35,000 the first year with just a 1% raise for the first five years. If it's the same exact job, and assuming you like the people at both companies exactly the same, and assuming that they're both the same amount of travel from your house, and they both have the same vacation policy, and all, all things else are exactly equivalent, which job would you take? We have the benefit of time. So take a moment on your own, and try, to, try to decide which job you would take. Get out your calculators, for sure.
Is it freezing? It's not appropriate language for my room again. Or for school. Just your basement. All right, Morgan. What do you like? Company A. And how much will you make at Company A over the five years? So you're going with your gut? Morgan, this is when math really matters. Really matters. Did you get Company B what you think you're going to make? Okay, bring me your paper. Hmm. Sarah, company do you like? Okay, you like company B. How much do you think you're going to be making there over the five years? At company B over five years. Anybody have anything different? So let me get this straight. Company B is going to pay you $35,000 your first year. And o over the span of five full years of working, you think you're going to make just over $35,000? That means you're working for, what number did you give me again? So $353. So, so the first year you're getting $35,000. And then the four years that follow, you're making $353 total for four years of work? The formula. There's four formulas, so we need to make sure we're understanding. But does that, does that answer even make sense? Over a five-year span, Company B is going to pay out $35,353? Oh, you gave yourself a 94% pay cut. What did you use for R? I think, I think, Morgan, you did something along the same lines. So here's the thing. In company A, in year, in year one, you're making 30,000, right? Plus, how do you figure out what you make in year two if you get a 6% raise? You make 30,000 in year one. How do you figure out your salary in year two if you're getting a 6% raise, Mackenzie? Okay, 30,000 times point zero six, and you're making $1,800 your second year? Wait, that's your salary your second year? That's your raise, so your actual salary is 31800 You follow? So your second term would be 31800 so what is the common ratio that would get you straight from one to the next? What is your multiplier that will give you? So 30,000 times what R value will get you directly to 31,800. You would just solve for your R, divide both sides by 30,000. So 31,800 divided by 30,000, 1.06. So rather than multiplying by 0 .06 and then adding it on to the original amount, just multiply by 1.06. That's your common ratio. Otherwise, you're giving yourself a 94% pay cut if your common ratio is 0 .06. You want your common ratio to be 1.06. So by retaining that one, you're keeping the same salary and then increasing it by 6% on top of that. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So then for the second one, you're starting at a higher amount, but you're getting a smaller raise. What's your common ratio, Mackenzie, on the second company? What would your common ratio be? Yes, 1.01. So here's the math. Sarah's number was right. So there's your series in company A, your series in company B. And company C is actually the better payout. Because you're making $5,000. Really well. Okay, so you we got to work on that. I don't want you taking the wrong job, kids. So, by chance, no, Morgan said company A. I don't know why she said company A. She did. 